Okay, great. You, um, you are muted, but you can use the uh, Q&A box uh, at, the bo at the bottom for questions. And I'll monitor that as we go along. And I may jump in if the question seems like it fits right with Ron's talking or at the end, if you raise your hand, it's a little easy, easier for me at the end, I can unmute you and, and you could do it that way as well. Or if you're more comfortable, you can certainly use the Q&A at the end as well. Um, so without further ado, I will um, turn the evening over to Ron Davis. Uh, good, thank you very much, David. Uh, can you all hear me, I hope? Sounds good. Okay, and uh, uh, I have uh, spent uh, a number of uh, uh, periods in the winter in uh, Northern Florida by choice, uh, avoiding Southern Florida because of the crowds. And I find that it's one of the best uh, birding areas in uh, the United States uh, for winter birding. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to share my experiences with you. And um, uh, first I'll start off by uh, showing you where and when uh, we uh, did this. Uh, uh, this is, uh, shows the Florida Peninsula and the Florida Panhandle. Uh, two of the areas were on the peninsula, the most Southern, which is really closer to uh, Central Florida than Northern. Uh, was at uh, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and Canaveral Na National Seashore. And then the other, uh, Ocala National Forest near the uh, small city of Ocala. And the, but most of what you're going to see was taken in the Panhandle area with an emphasis on St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. And um, uh, in addition, uh, we spent some time in Apalachicola National Forest and Tate's Hill uh, State Forest and at a wonderful uh, state park, uh, St. George, uh, St. George's Island. So um, you can see from this map that uh, the most heavily developed part of Florida seems to be around the center, but actually the density of development is greatest in the south in the vicinity of Miami and the vicinity of Tampa and uh, uh, these other Western cities. Whereas up here in the Panhandle, although there are red areas, for example, in Tallahassee and Pensacola uh, in the West, uh, it's relatively unsettled. And uh, in terms of population density, very much like uh, the state of Maine. So it's a, a welcoming place. Uh, of the uh, roughly 300 species of extant native bird species, uh, not counting incidentals, of northern Florida, uh, on these trips I saw about 160 and have documented uh, 125 of them with uh, photos. Uh, over half of the uh, 300 birds are passerine birds, in other words, uh, perching like a sparrow. Uh, but my photos include more non passerine species because they're easier to photograph. They're easier because they are typically larger uh, birds and less likely to be obscured by vegetation. Uh, a notable exception being some of the rails. The uh, presentation uh, tonight is uh, first part of a two part series. Uh, non passerine birds, including vultures, but not other rats. Uh, and uh, it will go through the sandpipers and allies. And then I'm reserving uh, the gulls through passerine birds for a possible other presentation uh, in the future. The major uh, bird habitats of the areas um, I was in uh, are listed here. But tonight uh, we're going to deal primarily with birds of the asterisk or starred uh, 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 habitats, brackish and freshwater marsh, uh, tidal marsh, uh, riverine uh, ecosystems, estuarine uh, ecosystems, lakes, and freshwater uh, impoundments. Here are a few examples to show you what they look like. Uh, this is a uh, freshwater marsh in St. Mark's uh, National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, it may be slightly brackish at times. And you can see that uh, water controls actually created this marsh. It's artificial. And um, um, the, uh, 
a hint given by the dead trees that were flooded when this took place. There were many more trees early on, but most of them are gone. So freshwater marsh, uh, salt marshes, uh, which are very extensive uh, compared to uh, the state of Maine's salt marshes. Um, and uh, these, of course, are tidal, uh, but the tides are not nearly as uh, great as we have here in the state of Maine. And then um, uh, brackish lagoons um, that are intertidal or uh, tidal ponds. And uh, this one is being is seen here at low tide and all the little white dots are, are birds uh, of, a, uh, of a, a wintering flock. And they also feed in the mud at this uh, uh, lagoon. Uh, white sand beaches, uh, which are relatively sterile uh, as far as birds go, but uh, they have some very interesting birds on them, which I'll show you later. Uh, the, uh, many of the beaches in uh, this part of, the, uh, of Florida and along the Gulf are, uh, have pure white sand. Riverine habitats, uh, often um, uh, bordered by, um, uh, oh, I'm having a, uh, uh, their- uh, Cypress. Uh, what? Cypress. Cypress, bald cypress. Thank you, my wife is standing behind me. I'm glad she uh, aided my memory. And uh, lakes. Uh, this one is a uh, pothole lake in limestone, uh, which is a predominant uh, rock type in um, uh, Northern Florida. Uh, now, the bird photos I'm going to show you, uh, all taken by me, uh, have uh, some text on them, and I'm not going to repeat all of that. Uh, and so uh, as we go along, see the, the species, it's either the top of the slide or the bottom of the slide, mostly, uh, in most cases, the bottom of the slide. The name of the species, its status uh, in uh, North Florida. And uh, for comparison, uh, so you can relate this to your own experience in Maine, uh, I give the status of the same species in Maine. And then uh, the breeding range, which is usually quite distant uh, from Northern Florida. So keep your eye out for that as the slides go along. I'm gonna start with swimmers and then the next part of the talk will be uh, 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 waders. And so, um, that's my own terminology, uh, and, uh, but ducks and grebes will be uh, in the first two groups of birds that I'm going to show you and uh, talk about. So uh, the first group of ducks, uh, some examples, uh, there are many more than I can show in this talk, are the dabbling ducks, the ones that tip up uh, with their tail in the air and their head underwater. And so uh, uh, characteristic uh, dabblers include the American widgeon, uh, which is also called the bald, bald pate uh, because of its uh, weight uh, uh, on the top of its head. Uh, this is a uh, dabbler uh, that's uh, quite commonly seen in uh, northern Florida in the winter. Uh, it eats mostly submerged vegetation and uh, during the winter it also does a lot of upland grazing and in other parts of its winter range it will often feed in uh, fallow or out of the season uh, agricultural fields. Another um, uh, uh, dabbler is the uh, northern pintail. It's uh, a, uh, a a bird uh, of um, shallow wetlands uh, where it feeds on seeds and aquatic plants and also invertebrates. Most of these ducks are omnivorous. Occasionally it makes shallow dives. The um, uh, northern shoveler is readily seen in northern Florida in the winter. Uh, it is a, a very interesting duck because it has a bill that uh, uh, looks like a shovel. And the bill is actually adapted for straining small invertebrates from the water. And uh, to do this, uh, they uh, put their, they hold their bill in the water uh, as they swim. And um, as they swim along, they're fil actually filtering small invertebrates uh, from the water. Uh, they uh, will sometimes forage in groups and uh, they'll swim in tight circles in a group to create a whirlpool effect uh, to bring food to the surface. 
Another dabbler and a very common widespread one uh, is the uh, uh, blue wing teal. And uh, it um, is a uh, mainly a vegetarian, uh, particularly on seeds. So those are some examples of dabblers uh, in the North Florida area. There are many more. Now, uh, another major group of ducks uh, is the divers. And uh, we'll start with an example of the redhead. Uh, the word duck is not in its name. In its winter range, it uh, feeds largely on marine plants. Uh, so it's um, in saline environments for the most part, including the uh, rhizomes of those plants, which it digs out with its bill. Uh, one of the interesting things about this bird is it's a facultative brood parasite. And uh, it often lays its eggs in the nests of other birds and gets the other bird to take care of its eggs. It's a common strategy uh, among uh, quite a few birds in uh, disparate groups of the bird kingdom. Now, uh, the ring neck duck, um, a ring neck duck, uh, maybe it should better be called the ring bill duck because it's almost impossible to see the ring in the field. Uh, around, around its neck. The uh, angular profile of the head is actually due to a short crest that it has. Uh, and it prefers the rather shallow uh, freshwater wetlands that uh, have an abundance of aquatic plants. It feeds largely on seeds and below sediment plant parts. Its uh, sediment neck ring is rarely seen in the field, but you may see a small suggestion to it in the male bird uh, uh, on the left. Uh, this um, bufflehead, uh, both uh, male and two females uh, shown here, uh, is actually the smallest diving duck, averaging only uh, about 13 and a half inches in length. Uh, it's small enough, uh, so and it, it's a, a cavity nester. And it's small enough uh, to fit in the holes of the uh, northern flicker, uh, which it often uses uh, for nesting. Uh, unlike in its breeding range, in winter, this is primarily a saltwater duck of shallow bays and inlets where it feeds on crustaceans and mollusks. One last diving duck, uh, some people don't think of it as a duck at all, is a meganser, the red-breasted meganser. And uh, this one is often seen at the coast. It's more often marine and estuarine than the common merganza. It feeds largely on small fish and crustaceans, but also on a wide variety of other foods. One last duck and a very widespread one and a common one that all of us are familiar with is the wood duck. And it doesn't seem to fit in either the dabbler or the diver category because it does a little bit of both. It's a very common bird of uh, forest bordered rivers and streams. And this one is shown along the Wakula River in, uh, uh, in the uh, Panhandle. But it also uh, lives in swamps and marshes. It's, uh, it nests in preformed natural cavities. It doesn't make its own cavity including pileated woodpecker holes. It's an omnivore in both plant parts and aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates. Uh, now, just to summarize what I've said about these uh, ducks, uh, there are nine species that I showed you, and uh, they're typical of the large majority of uh, ducks that are winter residents in Northern Florida. Only the wood duck nests in Northern Florida. The rest of them nest elsewhere. So um, uh, these are uh, like so many of the winter visitors from Maine that go down uh, to spend some time in Florida like myself. Um, their main uh, place to reside is not Florida, but they're there in the winter. Now in Maine, about half of these 26 species uh, of uh, ducks that are, are found in Northern Florida the, when they're in Maine, they're migrants and very rare breeders. They, um, none of them are uh, regular breeders with one or two exceptions, like the wood duck. Uh, only a few commonly nest in Maine, as I've already said. Uh, more broadly, uh, these birds uh, nest at wetlands and shores in forested northern U.S. northward at 
boreal, subarctic, and arctic regions. And some of them in the Great Plains uh, of Western United States. Now we'll look at a few other swimmer species that are not ducks. And the first one I'd like to uh, play some uh, uh, sound of. We'll give it a, a try here. Let's see what you think it is. So as some of you know, uh, that was a pie-billed grebe. It calls both on its winter grounds and uh, on its breeding grounds for the north. It's uh, the widest distribution of any grebe in North America. And um, it uh, commonly occurs in freshwater marshes, uh, particularly well-vegetated ones, uh, and lakes, particularly well-vegetated ones. Uh, it's an opportunistic predator on crustaceans and other invertebrates and small aquatic vertebrates like frogs. Uh, most of its food is obtained by diving. It's a, a quite an aggressive bird, uh, especially when it's on its breeding uh, territory. Now the uh, next uh, swimmer uh, is often seen uh, over northern Florida, or at least I, I shouldn't say often, uh, but I've seen it on many occasions, flying in huge flocks, sometimes uh, 100, 200, 300 birds in the same flock. And even at a distance, a great distance, you can see them because they're such large birds. Uh, these are American uh, white uh, pelicans and characteristically they have black tips to the wings and you can see the uh, long uh, fish feeding beaks of the bird. The uh, uh, their feet are primarily on fish, uh, but very unlike the uh, more uh, um, familiar brown pelican, uh, it doesn't um, uh, dive, uh, plunge dive like the brown pelican. It simply uh, swims along and uh, dips its bill and scoops up the fish. Uh, it feeds in a variety of aquatic habitats, and it also um, carries out cooperative foraging. Uh, coordinated flocks of swimming birds encircle fish or, or drive them into the shallows uh, where they become concentrated and can more easily be caught with synchronized bill dipping. Now, uh, although the uh, brown pelican also shown in this photo is a very large bird uh, and uh, is uh, uh, 40 centimeters long and with a wingspan of about two meters, uh, the white American white pelican is is much larger. Uh, it's enormous. Its uh, body length uh, averages 62 centimeters, well over a half a meter, and it has a wingspan of 2.5 to 3 meters. So this is truly an enormous bird. So uh, those were some examples of northern Florida's um, um, uh, swimming birds that you can easily see uh, if you visit that area. Now I'd like to show you some waders, uh, some of which can actually swim, like some of the rails, for example, are good swimmers. Uh, but uh, they're primarily um, uh, feed by, by wading. And uh, so we'll start out uh, with um, one of the uh, more common groups, uh, the bitterns, herons, and egrets. And what I've done in this slide is I've uh, double, asked, double starred uh, the ones that are most common. And those are the bitterns, herons, and egrets, and the sandpipers and allies. And others that are quite common are plovers and the uh, groups of rails that includes the gallinules and the, the coots. Uh, so I'll show you more of those than of some of the others. So the, here's the first group, the bitterns, herons, and egrets. And uh, except for the bitterns, the herons and egrets uh, uh, fly uh, with a, a down curved neck, uh, very much uh, like, uh, unlike the other uh, long legged, uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, sizable waders, uh, the um, uh, storks and the, uh, oh, what's the other group? Help me out with that one. I don't know. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'll think of it later. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, so the first one of these birds that we're going to see uh, makes a sound like this one. This is a, a fairly common wintering bird in uh, northern Florida. And uh, unlike many other waders, it's uh, fairly solid and, uh, of course, cryptically, cryptically colored and often hard to see. Uh, and its um, method of foraging is actually uh, quite interesting and uh, differs from most other waders. It uh, forages by stealth uh, rather than by chase. It remains motionless for more long periods of time. And uh, in this way, it captures passing prey uh, by lunging at them. And it's not detected by these passing prey. And so they'll so often just pass by right at the feet uh, of, the, uh, of the bittern. And uh, these include invertebrates and vertebrates and even mice. Uh, it's most active around dawn and dusk and will actually feed at night as well. Uh, when it's unique call, it often can be heard. Uh, another waiter uh, is, uh, can barely be seen in this photograph along the Wakula River. Uh, in your, on your screen, perhaps you see a, a little white dot uh, right there. Uh, that is a, uh, a great egret. And um, uh, it's sitting on uh, at some little vegetation which extends out uh, to the shore, uh, from the shore. A little bit closer here, you can see the base of a bald cypress and lots of uh, Spanish moss. And um, we'll uh, take a look a little bit closer. Now, um, the great egret uh, is a species that usually nests in trees, uh, but here we have an exception. You can see it's sitting on a nest. Uh, and uh, some of the other tree nesters also occasionally uh, will nest on the ground. Uh, this species is the symbol of the National Audubon Society. Uh, Audubon and other conservation groups helped to bring it back from its population low uh, in the Western Hemisphere in the early 20th century. Uh, the population low was caused by overhunting, uh, mainly for plumes. Uh, the great egret uh, occurs in a wide range of wetlands, uh, from freshwater to marine, where it feeds mainly on fish but also on uh, other vertebrates and uh, invertebrates. Now the um, bird that was uh, on the uh, title slide and in the uh, publicity for this talk is the reddish egret, which is a nationally threatened species. Uh, it's a bird with a rather limited geographic range um, compared to most of the other species in this presentation. It's, rarest, it's the rarest of the North American egrets and herons. It, hunting nearly eliminated it uh, in the, in, by 1900. Uh, presently, there are only about 7,000 to 11,000 adults. It is a species of conservation concern throughout its range. It frequents estuaries and coastal lagoons where it is often seen on shallow flats. It's extremely active in pursuit of prey by running, flying, hopping, uh, foot stirring, wing flicking, and other behaviors. Now, um, here uh, is a photo, it's a little indistinct, of a reddish egret uh, about to um, uh, start out on one of its feeding routines. Uh, most of these routines are a variation of disturbing and chasing their prey. When I took this photo, uh, the bird was about to begin a run with open wings. The form of foraging behavior I was about to observe is called canopy feeding. According to uh, Leanne Kokzur, and others in 1920, and I quote from them, 
the individual runs forward with wings extended, halts and peers into the water and brings both wings forward over its head, forming a canopy, uh, a canopy overhead and overhead and neck. Uh, this pose held for a few moments or even uh, several minutes produces a shadow which presumably uh, attracts uh, fish. And uh, at least that's the hypothesis. And uh, it has quite a few other similar uh, behaviors that are very active uh, when it's feeding. Uh, this is a, a snowy egret. Uh, it uh, is a bird of uh, shallow estuary and sites. And uh, like the British egret, it displays a great variety of active feeding behaviors to capture small crustaceans and fish. The species is known for its beautiful breeding plumage, only part of which is displayed in this photo. In the late 1800s, its back plumes were sold for more than the price of gold on a weight basis. Since the hunting of plumes and resultant population decline, the species has completely recovered, uh, partly due to uh, the uh, uh, activities of the Audubon Society. Another interesting heron is the little blue heron. It occurs in smaller numbers even than the uh, uh, reddish egret. It forages in a variety of uh, freshwater and estuary and seashore habitats where it eats mainly fish, but also crustaceans, frogs, frogs and grasshoppers. Now here is a comparison of two birds that I showed you photos of. The one on the left is a snowy egret. The one on the right is a little blue heron in its juvenile plumage. And at a distance, it's very easy to confuse these two birds when you're trying to identify them. But when you're up close, you can see some of the details as you can in this photo. So I was fortunate to get them standing side by side on a rotting log. Uh, the one on the left has red as black legs with um, yellow feet or golden feet, and it has a black bill uh, with uh, uh, yellow uh, at the base of the bill extending to the eye. Whereas the little, the juvenile little blue heron on the right has very differently colored legs and feet and a partly light colored bill and lacks the bright. Uh, yellow at the base of the bill. So they're actually fairly easy to tell themselves apart, uh, but at a, at, a, at a distance, they're very difficult. Now, on one day, uh, we um, did some birding uh, toward evening at a place that had, uh, that had a, was a flooded wetland uh, with um, some palm trees uh, that had nesting birds at their top. In this case, a, uh, a wood stork, a wood stork, and over here, a great uh, blue heron. And so the sun was going down. Uh, at first, uh, 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 in an overcast, uh, behind the overcast or clouds. So the uh, lighting was very flat. Uh, but even in January, when this picture was taken, they were nesting the uh, great blue herons. Uh, this one about to settle down on its eggs. This uh, bird is quite widespread in uh, Northern Florida and common in the winter in both marine estuary and, uh, and freshwater habitat. So it's uh, quite a generalist in terms of habitat. It's uh, primarily a fish eater, uh, but also stalks uplands for rodents and other animals. So on this January 28th, at a wetland near Orlando, in this case, this is one of the most southern places uh, we were, uh, I obtained a series of photos of these nesting great blue herons uh, between 6.53 and 7.29 p.m., uh, shortly before the 8 p.m. sunset. Uh, at first, the sun was obscured behind clouds, producing flat lighting, as in this photo, of a bird settling down on its eggs. Then the clouds uh, moved away from the setting sun and I obtained the following photo. When my wife saw this photo, she said, oh, are these two different species? 
and uh, because the one below uh, is much smaller than the one above. But that's a, a bit of a uh, um, not quite right because uh, what's happened here to make the bird on top look so much bigger is that it has its neck, its neck and its uh, legs extended, and its bird and its its um, wings extended, whereas the bird below has its neck folded, and um, it's uh, uh, leaning down a little bit more. But actually, these two birds are almost the same size. The tricolored heron, a uh, very colorful bird, one of my favorites, uh, subsists almost entirely on a diet uh, of marsh fishes and estuary fishes. Uh, typically, uh, an individual forages in isolation. Uh, so unlike the other waders that I've shown you that sometimes will be foraging in groups, this one is almost always by itself. Uh, the populations of this beautiful species have been declining and it's considered a threatened species in Florida, but it's not nationally threatened. So now I'm moving uh, from the bay herons and egrets to the night herons uh, to um, look at the two species that are present. The, uh, uh, I've seen this species, the black crowned night heron on multiple continents. Uh, around the world. It's the most widespread heron in the world. Uh, it um, roosts by day and feeds mainly around dawn and dusk and at night, uh, and uh, mostly on aquatic prey, especially fish. But it also uh, eats a wide range of terrestrial organisms. Now, one doesn't always get a, to photograph the adult of a species or photograph a bird under ideal conditions. This species of night heron is most often encountered at wooded sites where lighting is poor and photography is difficult. The species specializes in capturing and eating crabs and crayfish at uh, forested wetlands, including mangroves and other swamps. Now, how did I tell this juvenile of the yellow crowned night heron from the very similar juvenile of the um, yellow crown uh, uh, night heron. Well, uh, the way is to <clears throat> look at its grayer back, has a grayer back, it has less conspicuous white spots, uh, it has a paler face, uh, it has a shorter and a stockier bill, and the bill is dark gray rather than yellow, and that's how to tell the, the juvenile uh, from the other night heron. Now, uh, there are some other uh, <clears throat> waders and shorebirds that uh, I saw in northern Florida um, that are not uh, in the uh, egret or and heron group. Uh, one of these uh, is the <clears throat> glossy ibis. This is the uh, most widespread ibis in the world, and uh, it's present on many, uh, several continents and many areas. It's a bird of inland wetlands and to a lesser extent coastal ones. Uh, like many of the other shorebirds uh, that feeds uh, in the mud, it's a tactile forager. It probes the sediment and finds invertebrates on which it feeds. It feels them out uh, and that doesn't uh, feed by sight. Uh, typically, uh, the white ibis uh, feeds, uh, flies, and nests in large flocks, and it's quite abundant in southeastern United States wetlands, uh, both freshwater and estuarine. Uh, in Florida, the uh, species is of special concern uh, because of loss of habitat to development, uh, pollution, and water management. Its uh, juvenile stage of the white ibis is quite different in appearance, usually brown above, but it retains a pink bill and has uh, pink legs, not as striking as uh, those of the adult. Hey, Ron, you have a question that has to do with white birds. And I thought I'd jump in here because of the white ibis you just sh showed. Um, Dorothy Gilman asked, 
how did the how does the white plumage aid the juvenile little blue heron? And then she goes on to say, indeed, what benefits uh, is white plumage to any bird? Wow, that's a uh, a very good question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, uh, it has something to do with the uh, unique. Um, character of uh, plumage color and its relation to uh, mating, but uh, that's as close as I can get. Uh, was it Dorothy who asked that question? Dorothy Gilman, yes, yeah. I guess the, I guess the, the thought, may, it, not to put words in her mouth, but I guess thinking that white is such a conspicuous col color, making sure. a bird stand out, that uh, what advantages there, there might be to that. But uh, as you said, uh, it's uh, maybe a bit of a mystery. Uh, it is, well, it, there may be some answers and I'm gonna have to do some research on that afterwards. But uh, it could have something to do with uh, recognizability by, by mates or other members of the species. Uh, but uh, that's as close as I can get and that's very vague. Sorry, Dorothy. Thanks for the question though. Now, uh, here we have a species, the uh, roseate spoonbill uh, which is very near to its northern limit uh, in northern Florida. Uh, and it occurs there only sporadically, as is true of many birds at their limit. Uh, but it's uh, more regularly seen in, in southern Florida. Uh, like many uh, such birds uh, that are near their north, northern range in Florida, northern end of their range, uh, they're very common in South America. And uh, this one uh, fits that. It is a very common South American bird. It uh, has a wide range of habitats, and, uh, but it is a bird of special concern uh, in Florida uh, because of loss of habitat uh, to development. Uh, in its uh, shallow aquatic habitats, it has an interesting way of uh, feeding uh, uh, by tactile location. In other words, by feeling out uh, its prey uh, and rather than uh, visual recognition. Uh, what it does is it swings the slightly open spoon of its bill side to side in a semicircular motion in the water as it walks. And uh, when it contacts prey, the bill snaps shut. And it, uh, mainly on fish and aquatic invertebrates. So like many of the waders, it's a tactile uh, feeder. Uh, these dirty birds are wood storks. And they, I often see them with their white plumage uh, soiled uh, like this. It's the only stork species in North America. And, uh, uh, and it's the largest wading bird uh, in North America. Uh, it's about a, a, a meter tall uh, when its uh, neck is extended. Uh, in northern Florida, it's uh, near the northern end of its range, like the roseate spoonbill of its breeding range. And um, the bulk of its range is in South America. It too is a tactile feeder, walking with submerged and partly open bill, capturing aquatic organisms, mainly fish. It's a threatened species in the United States, mainly because of loss of habitat due to water management. Now, while I was looking at these birds, uh, a good part of the time, uh, there were black uh, vultures overhead or in the distance. Very common sight, much more so in Florida, northern Florida than in Maine, even southern Maine. Uh, and, uh, but interestingly, almost always, uh, the, um, uh, the black vultures were accompanied uh, by uh, turkey vultures. They were in uh, mixed groups. And uh, while it's, uh, this particular vulture is almost entirely a carrion feeder, uh, performing a very useful function in clearing the land of carrion, uh, surprisingly, it lacks uh, a highly sensitive sense of smell. So it often relies on the superior olfactory sense of the turkey vultures. And by following them to carcasses, they're able to displace the turkey vultures at the food. And uh, that's the way they uh, make their living uh, in large part. Note that they have a bare gray head. 
the uh, turkey vulture um, in flight uh, has dark wing coverts uh, and they contrast with the more silvery flight feathers behind them. Um, differentiating um, the front from the back of the wing to the observer below. This contrast is not so great in this photo because of light coming from below rather than more typically from above. Uh, top illumination uh, would brighten the translucent flight feathers, heightening the contrast uh, with the dark covert area. Uh, so this two-tone wing is uh, a, a very quick way of telling a turkey vulture from a black vulture. Note the bare red head. Sometimes it's too distant to see that. Another uh, wader, which uh, can be seen in Northern Florida, but not very commonly, uh, is the limpkin, uh, which is so-called because its gait uh, resembles a limp. Uh, its range approximately coincides, uh, very interesting, and I think, uh, with its main food, the Pomacia apple snail. So if you look at the uh, map of the range of the Pomacia apple snail, and it's almost the same as the range of the limpkin. Uh, its bill is slightly asymmetric. Maybe you can see that. And the lower bill has a shallow scoop. Uh, that's just right for extracting the snail from its shell. It also feeds on other uh, snails and mussel species. Uh, northern Florida is close to the northern limit of its largely tropical range. Uh, an important uh, set of waders uh, are the uh, rails and the very closely related in the same family, gallinules and coots are really, really a form of rail. Uh, the first of which uh, that I'll show you is the American coot. Uh, you can see that uh, not only does water uh, shed from the back of the duck, but it also sheds from the back of the coot as the little, little water droplets on its back will show. This is the uh, most aquatic and widely distributed rail uh, in North America. Uh, it uh, lives in a range of freshwater wetlands, lakes, and ponds, and uh, some coastal habitats also. It's an excellent swimmer and diver, uh, but uh, it uh, spends a lot of time waiting as well. Uh, it's almost entirely an herbivore and also feeds on land. Now, the next uh, bird, I'll uh, play its call, or one of its calls, a most common one, and you can see if you can tell me what it is. It's a rail, a type of rail. So here it is, it's the common gallinule, a very noisy bird. It's about the size of a small duck. And it has long toes that make it easy uh, for it to walk on um, floating vegetation. It's also a good swimmer, dabbler, and diver, and a very noisy critter as you um, just heard. Uh, and it, it's very abundant in the winter in Florida at any weedy freshwater habitat. But then as you approach the freshwater habitat, you uh, typically will hear this bird uh, calling. Now its relative, uh, a more southern relative, is the uh, uh, purple gallinule. Uh, and it's uh, probably one of the most colorful birds uh, I have ever photographed. And has very similar behavior to the common gallinule. Uh, walking uh, either uh, on the mud or on the surface vegetation uh, with its long toes. I'm going to play a song of the next rail and see if um, it seems familiar to you.
Yes, you're right. That's the Sora. This is the most abundant and widely distributed North American rail. It, in the winter uh, in Northern Florida, it uh, is found in freshwater marshes, uh, ones that are, tend to be dominated by emergent vegetation. And it too, like uh, some of the other rails I showed you, can walk on floating vegetation, in this case on water lilies. And uh, its uh, diet uh, consists of, of both seeds and invertebrates. Now, um, uh, on many a day, I would hear uh, from um, the salt marshes uh, this particular um, uh, call. But I was never able to see the bird. And I kept trying to find this bird, uh, but it seemed to be obscured in the uh, marsh grasses. So I kept going out early in the morning um, and um, several times before dawn to search for the bird. And uh, finally, on a very foggy morning, I found the clapper rail. Uh, many of you may have seen it, uh, but uh, I guess I was, wasn't as lucky as you were. And uh, uh, now thanks to the uh, magic of Photoshop, uh, I was uh, able to uh, convert this photo to one that was uh, uh, clearer. And uh, look at the form of the rail with its wings outstretched and you'll see the same bird in the same picture uh, after treatment with the photo, the uh, fog is gone. Uh, this rail is, as I've said, more frequently heard than seen, and um, it typically feeds deep within the salt marsh uh, or the mangrove vegetation. It uh, feeds largely on crustaceans, especially in fi uh, at fiddler crabs, inserting, sometimes inserting its bill into the burrow of the uh, fiddler crab, uh, but also on a, on a wide variety of other foods and crustaceans. And in Florida, it's a hunted species. You can actually get a license to hunt it. Um, you can see the color of the clapper a little bit better uh, on a clear day than you can on a uh, foggy day as shown uh, in this picture. So that's the end of the rails. And then another interesting bird in uh, North Central Florida around Ocala, uh, we would, um, we had a, uh, a vacation rental on a small lake in Ocala where uh, we saw these birds flying, feeding, and uh, they would be trumpeting with their trumpet call that I'm going to play for you in a minute. Uh, and um, I was, uh, was having difficulty getting a decent photo of it. But one day on my way to Ocala on a shopping trip, I noticed a, a nesting crane at a small roadside wetland. Uh, and I returned before dawn the next day uh, to obtain these pictures uh, as the sun came up. Uh, this bird, um, uh, Sandhill crane, uh, belongs to a non-migratory subspecies that's found only in Florida. Uh, and it lives there year round, doesn't migrate. The, uh, uh, usually it's found in a fairly open habitats like grasslands, meadows, and uh, shallow wetlands. Uh, and an, another interesting thing about the Sandhill Crane, it is a, a long-term socially monogamous uh, species and they, the pair bond lasts for quite a few years. And in the case of in this, uh, when they're nesting, the uh, pair takes turns uh, at the nest. And uh, this, uh, uh, I don't know if this is the bird that you just saw or its mate, this they look almost identical, but they would call to each other uh, as the, uh, their partner uh, was approaching, 
and, and trumpeting to them, the bird on the nest would also trumpet. It was quite fascinating uh, watching and listening uh, to these birds. Uh, now you may have to turn up your volume a little bit to hear this in a fairly quiet recording, but this is the trumpeting sound that they make. One moment. Now I'm gonna move on to the plovers. And uh, uh, I had never uh, seen a killdeer in an environment like this. One day uh, we went boating out uh, and uh, visited uh, at low tide a, um, uh, an oyster bed. And um, believe it or not, the uh, killdeer was uh, foraging uh, in the oyster bed, picking off little invertebrates as it went along. And uh, uh, this is, uh, as some of you may know, a bird mainly of open areas, fields and other wetlands. So uh, this was a, an unusual uh, a sighting uh, of the bird. And uh, that picture was uh, difficult to get because it, the boat was rocking. Uh, the uh, black belly uh, plover um, in winter plumage has no black belly. Uh, the last time I had seen it before this sighting uh, was at a tundra site near Nome, Alaska in, uh, uh, in May, uh, where it had recently arrived. I guess it was late May. Uh, and it arrived to breed. It's, it's one of the most wide ranging uh, shorebird species. And although it breeds on um, both dry and wet tundra in the Arctic, uh, at its southern winter grounds, it's largely a bird of marine shorelines uh, where it feeds on marine worms, small bivalves, and a range of other uh, invertebrates. This photo uh, was taken at a beautiful near white uh, sand beach in glaring midday sun. And um, you can see its shadow is almost directly under the bird. Like the uh, similar piping plover, uh, the snowy uh, plover is a species of great concern because it too is a ground nester, especially in areas that are favored by humans for outdoor recreation uh, and uh, seaside property development. It forages uh, both in the inner tidal uh, on invertebrates and above uh, the tide, uh, mainly on insects. Here's some other waders, uh, the first of which uh, is uh, mainly a, short, a bird of salt marshes, uh, the American oyster catcher, uh, which you can see in Northern Florida. Uh, it uh, can be seen on beaches, on sandbars, clam flats, oyster beds, etc. cetera. Uh, it feeds especially on bivalve mollusks and it has a laterally compressed bill flattened from side to side, uh, which uh, uh, facilitates the insertion of the bill into the partially open shells of bivalves. This photo was taken just before sunset, uh, turning the white parts of the bird to gold. It is the American avocet in its winter plumage uh, where it lacks the uh, orangish uh, neck of the uh, breeding plumage. The striking long recurved bill of this bird is used for tactile feeding like so many of the other waders on invertebrates, uh, invertebrates in the mud. Uh, but it also takes prey uh, in the water at their feet. It is often found in Florida in mangroves. The last group of birds uh, of this already long talk uh, is the sandpipers and their allies. And they're all in winter plumage. So they look quite different than what they might look in Maine or farther north. 
the uh, short bill dowager. Um, why do they call it short bills? Because it actually has quite a long bill, despite uh, its name. Uh, it's just that the bill is shorter than that of the long bill dowager. Uh, this medium-sized shorebird is said to have a straight bill, but to me, it seems like many individuals have a slightly downturned bill. What do you think? Um, together with uh, size and this long bill and its distinct pale eyebrow, uh, it's fairly easy to identify. Uh, in Florida, it frequents mudflats and brackish lagoons, uh, where, like so many other waders, it feeds largely on aquatic invertebrates. The Dunlin is a, a very abundant uh, wader. Uh, it's a type of uh, sandpiper. And uh, it, in winter, it lacks the striking rufous back and black belly of, of its breeding plumage. The tip of the bill is slightly down curved, as you can see in this photo. The Dunlin occurs in huge flocks. And uh, sometimes these flocks number in the many thousands. Uh, here is uh, a, a, slot, a flock in the many hundreds, uh, but not uh, many thousands. And a bit closer, you could see that, uh, the bird has a very striking brownish gray back and uh, uh, striking white areas on both the wing and the tail. An interesting bird to look at uh, is the marble godwit, which in this photo is accompanied by a group of dowagers. They have a distinct long recurved bill. The three of these birds, of the three, uh, the two farthest to the right are females, and the one uh, closest to the left is a male. And as you can see, the male has a shorter bill uh, than uh, the female. They uh, probe for marine worms and small bivalves and take crabs from the surface using their very long bill. The sanderling uh, is the palest uh, of the, uh, sandpipers in winter, has a lot of white and gray. Uh, the tip of the bill is slightly spatulate. You can see it's expanded at the tip. They frequent coastal beaches, where uh, sandy beaches, hence the name Sanderling, uh, where they display a rather interesting feeding behavior. Some of you may have seen these sandpipers running back and forth up and down the shore, uh, chasing receding waves down slope feeding on marine invertebrates at or under the, the wet surface that the, recede, uh, re, that the uh, receding wave has exposed. And then when the wave, a wave comes in again, they run back up the beach barely ahead uh, of the wave, uh, never getting submerged by the, by the waves. Uh, the bird in this photo is walking on the wet surface that was just left by a wave uh, searching for prey. This bird uh, is about to turn down slope as a wave rece receives. The front of the wave is in white and uh, the water is right shallow and this water is going to recede rather rapidly and the bird is going to run down slope. And then um, uh, you see a bird uh, that is picking up a food item as a wave is coming toward it, and in just a moment, it will uh, pick this uh, uh, morsel up and race back up slope ahead of the incoming wave, never getting hit by the wave. Very rapid uh, movement. Now, here's a bit of a puzzle. Uh, a slight hint is that underneath the uh, vent of the bird, you can see some spots. Uh, maybe you can see my pointer. And, uh, but other than that, uh, it's uh, nearly pure white on the bottom and brown or brown gray on the top and with yellow legs. Now, this is the most widespread sandpiper in North America and I'm sure you've all seen it because it teeters up and down. In winter, it doesn't look 
at all like what the name indicates. It isn't spotted except for those uh, few spots that I pointed out. Uh, and um, one of the keys uh, to identifying the bird, in addition to those few spots, is that uh, it has a breast area here, which is dark. It comes down, uh, uh, it's, it's a lateral breast patch, uh, uh, patch and has light colored legs. And um, it also teeters in the wintertime, so that is a giveaway. Uh, the species is found in almost all habitats near water, and it has a correspondingly wide diet. Uh, the next bird sounds like the following uh, sound that I'm gonna play um, at it, when it's at its breeding grounds. Let's give that a try. Uh, Uh, you're right, uh, that was the winnowing sound of the Wilson snipe. And uh, uh, this uh, bird is in the same family with the bird family as sandpipers, so it's actually a type of sandpiper. Uh, and in the wintertime, it uh, is in a typical sandpiper habitat, uh, marshes, uh, both uh, freshwater and, uh, but particularly in uh, uh, saline marshes near the seashore. The sound, the winnowing sound that you just heard is um, not a vocal sound. It's made in the, during the uh, flying mating uh, uh, display of the bird uh, by the flow of air over the spread tail feathers. And uh, those uh, sounds off the tail feathers are modulated by the beating of the wings to make the winnowing sound. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you can hear it qu quite commonly. We hear it from our house around this time of year uh, here in Orono, uh, Maine. And uh, in the winter uh, it, in Florida, it's found in swamps and marshy wetlands and wet meadows. Like uh, most of the other sandpipers, it has uh, a very sensitive bill tip with uh, nerve endings that uh, detect invertebrates in the, in the mud. So they are, they're feeders like the other sandpipers, for the most part, not entirely, uh, by uh, tactile uh, sensation rather than uh, by sight. One of the last birds we'll look at uh, is, uh, was seen by me on uh, the same oyster bed as uh, the where the, the picture I showed you of the killdeer earlier uh, from a rocking boat. And so it took a while and I had a lot of blurred pictures uh, to sort through. It was foraging like, like the killdeer among the oyster shells. Um, this large bird is actually a curlew, a type of curlew. And uh, in the winter, it, uh, its habitat consists mainly of tidal flats and to a lesser extent, a wide range of other shore and near shore habitats farther south, including coral reefs and around where we were, oyster beds. Uh, now, the next bird uh, I'm going to play, and one of the last, la in fact, the last birds in this talk is a pair of birds. One of them. What you were hearing uh, was a greater yellow legs. Uh, the, uh, an example of which is shown on the right side of this photo uh, next to its uh, congeneric um, partner, the uh, lesser yellow legs on the left. It's very rare to see these two birds together and even rarer since to get a photo of them together. It's often difficult um, because they look very much alike although these birds certainly do look different to the eye, but if you see them alone uh, and the next time you see the other one, it, they do look a lot, uh, very much alike. 
Uh, and at a distance, it's very hard to tell their size. The greater averages are around 14 inches long at 36 centimeters, and the lesser uh, only about 10 and a half inches long or 27 centimeters. Uh, the lesser has a similar call to the one I played of the greater uh, yellow legs, uh, but it's a little bit more clipped and the notes are all in one pitch. And um, uh, they feed uh, like many of the other waders that, waders that I've shown you on invertebrates and fish and frogs, and uh, occasionally they'll, they'll eat berries and, and seeds. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much wraps up. And I'd like to summarize the uh, uh, sandpiper part of the talk where I showed you nine species. Uh, and um, the question is, are uh, these species typical of the 26 uh, sandpipers that occur in um, Northern Florida? And in the following respects, um, they are quite similar. Uh, all but one of the 26 are only winter residents in Northern Florida. And that one is the one which I haven't shown you a picture of. Uh, the large majority of the 26 uh, have winter ranges that extend well into the tropics and even to the South Temperate region. And several of these birds are long distance migrants. Only a few of the uh, 26 are known to breed in Maine. For example, the Wilson snipe. The large majority of the 26 do not nest in the conterminous United States, but do so in uh, boreal, subarctic, and Arctic regions. So in conclusion, um, I should say that uh, I'm really sold on birding in Northern Florida. I think it's a great place for winter birding. It's away from the cold in uh, Maine and uh, away from the crowds of Southern Florida. And uh, only a few species uh, that occur in uh, South Florida uh, uh, don't occur in Northern Florida. Almost all of them occur in Northern Florida as well. On the left is a taste of part two, which uh, of this uh, talk, which uh, there's no time for now. Um, and uh, those are, that part is the gulls through the passerine birds. And uh, this taste is in the form of the very noisy Carolina Wren. So that's uh, the end of the talk, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, a couple questions. Uh, one, if you recall the, the photo of the oyster catcher, uh, Molly Williams asks, uh, uh, noticed that there was a tag on there, and she wondered who who was the research researcher or organization that tags oyster catchers? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I saw several birds, um, uh, for example, that had tags, including the snowy plover. But uh, I didn't have contact uh, with the birding community in the areas of Florida where uh, I was uh, photographing. Uh, so uh, I just don't know the answer. Uh, comment from Dorothy Gilman. Uh, thank you for the great talk and the wonderful photos. And I would um, underscore that as well. The, uh, the photos are incredible. I always really enjoy um, how you frame your photos and the care that you take. And uh, I was, <laughs> was really impressed by the, the double, the yellow legs. That's a keeper for sure. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dorothy. Let's see, we've got, um, let's see, where are your favorite places to bird in Northern Florida? I guess you kind of, I guess you kind of mentioned those. Were there any other places in Northern Florida, Ron, that, that you didn't mention that you would recommend for birding? Well, uh, uh, the, I did mention uh, St. George's Island. Uh, that's a wonderful place, uh, one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. And uh, uh, I would definitely not miss that one. The, uh, there are many birding spots in the uh, Appalachia uh, Cola Forest, uh, National Forest, which is a very large area uh, that occupies a good chunk of the central part of the uh, uh, panhandle. 
uh, let's see what other places are good places. Uh, well, uh, uh, along the Wakula River, which I did refer to, but uh, taking a canoe uh, uh, down or up the Wakula is not only a place to see uh, uh, lots of birds, uh, including uh, uh, different types of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, let's see, mergansers that we haven't uh, seen in this talk. Um, and um, uh, and also amenities. Uh, it's a, a river that emerges from one of the largest springs in the world. Uh, a lot of water comes down from the uplands in uh, southern um, Georgia and uh, bubbles up through the um, uh, the limestone, the Florida limestone, uh, in the uh, <clears throat> Panhandle, uh, producing springs. And uh, these springs um, uh, form rivers that uh, uh, flow to the sea uh, less than uh, 50 miles from their origin. Uh, so that, that's a wonderful spot. Uh, and I recommend doing it by canoe. Nice. Um, Brenda Moulton asks, because uh, you mentioned a couple of times, Ron, a number of those species, uh, their breeding habitats will be uh, up into the Arctic. And her question was, why do birds breed there? Ah, well, there are a number of uh, uh, theories about that. Uh, one of them is that uh, the Arctic has a very um, rapid flush of, um, of food uh, in the, uh, during the uh, brief season. And, uh, so it, it's a concentration of uh, insects and uh, other uh, and small animals, including small mammals, uh, in the tundra in particular, uh, which uh, are great for uh, raising young. Uh, 